welcome back. Hey everyone, this is Chris. So, the Wii U gamepad was a lot of things. It was clunky, it was composed of outdated technology, it was awkward and weird. And yet, like I said, it really was able to be so many different things, and I love it for that. It was a map, a tool belt, a blank canvas for you to draw on, a smartphone, an alternate view, and yet it still could have been even more. But most importantly, in my view at least, it was meant to be what I would see as being something of a Trojan horse to usher in a new dimension of gaming interactivity. Now, I know that might sound a little too intense, and some of you might understandably even scoff at this idea, especially considering the reputation that the Wii U has developed over the past few years, but today I wanted to talk about something I feel very strongly about, which is that one of gaming's most innovative devices failed to have its uniquely paradigm-shifting properties understood by the public. So this is my first solo episode. This is something I've been wanting to do for about a year now. Um, so for this episode, it's just going to be me speaking. I think I'm going to break it up into two parts. So I hope that you guys enjoy what I have to share with you today. But before I get into it, uh, I just wanted to say three quick things. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you to Ryan, Jacob, and Josh, my co-hosts, just for everything. Um, for letting me onto the show, obviously, and of course giving me this platform for me to speak my mind about the hobby that I and all of us love so much. And also just for being so supportive and open-minded. It's been so refreshing to work with a group where we all just complement each other so well. It's been just such a treat to just bounce ideas off of each other. So thank you guys so much, and I'm really looking forward to all future episodes that we have in store for everyone. Um, I also wanted to thank all of our listeners and fans. Um, it's been so great to just listen, talk, and play with games with you guys online. Um, it's just very comforting to realize like how much I have in common with people, not just across the nation, which is already incredible, but all over the world. And you've all been so kind and friendly. It's just been so encouraging. So thank you all so very much. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is that for our listeners, I wanted to give a little bit of a heads up. Um, we might be taking a little bit of a break, um, my co-host and I, um, and we might be putting out slightly less shows um, than we normally do at like a, you know, a slower pace. Um, we have plenty more ideas and shows planned, trust me, a whole ton, but we're all just so busy for very different reasons, whether it's family or um, you know, school or work or stuff like that. Um, so we just have a lot going on. We're a little burnt out just because, you know, for everyone, the past year has been pretty difficult and we're still kind of adjusting. So thank you all for your patience and your understanding. Uh, this is just a temporary break, if it even ends up being a break, um, because I'm, I'm very anxious to make more shows, but there's just a lot that we're all juggling. So just wanted to give a little heads up about that. Um, it's very possible that we'll just keep rolling out episodes the same way that we did, but I just don't really see that happening. So, um, yep, like I said, wanted to give a heads up about that. Um, all right, so let's get back to my topic for today. So please understand, as Awada would say, I'm not at all arguing that the Wii U gamepad is the best gaming controller ever. Trust me. It feels cheap and light. I hate the buttons. They're very, like, gushy to me. Um, it is a very comfortable controller, but even the Wii U's Pro controller, whenever it's possible to use it, is just a million times better. So... Yeah, like I said, the gamepad is not the best controller ever made at all. I just don't like how it feels. But I would like to make the case saying that it is one of the most interesting controllers and or what I would consider to be a tool or accessory to ever be introduced to our favorite hobby, gaming. 
So in my view, there's two main categories of consoles, and they're both great in totally different ways. So I see it that there's evolutionary consoles, which just makes them nice inevitable enhancements from the previous console, such as the jump from the Nintendo to the Super Nintendo. So the Super Nintendo had way better graphics and sound capabilities, a, a slightly better controller, etc. It was just better and had more capabilities all around. All good things, but nothing exactly groundbreaking. A step up, but nothing, you know, that's going to change the industry, even though it was a phenomenal console. And then there's revolutionary consoles. So the evolutionary consoles and revolutionary consoles. Revolutionary consoles, in my view, they just throw out all the rules, or at least a lot of them. And they just have this wild, outside-the-box concept that they just want to push the paradigm of what gaming is and what it can be. So you might be wondering which consoles I might be referring to. So let's just rewind a little bit. Let's remember how the leap from 2D graphics to 3D graphics was monumental. Just think about how different Super Mario World and Super Mario 64 look, sound, and feel. Just think about how huge it was when we went from a four-direction D-pad on the Super Nintendo controller to a joystick that had 360 degrees of control. That said, I think that and in this case especially, it's important to note that with great power comes great responsibility, as corny of a saying as that is. And within the context of the Nintendo 64, Nintendo clearly had a technology that they understood and believed in. So let's just take note of that for later. Then, in the case of the Nintendo DS and Wii, the introduction of touch and motion controls allowed your physical human body to, in a sense, become the controller. We were so used to pressing a button to swing a sword, but then with the Wii U Motion Plus in particular, Nintendo literally let us swing around a sword just how we always imagined it. Now, the DS and Wii are prime examples of what I would consider to be a revolutionary console. The DS wasn't just a slightly nicer Game Boy Advance, but it also had an adaptable form factor. It introduced new features that allowed you to interact with software in completely different ways, like I said, touch, and also your voice. And eventually with the DSi, your face and body without even touching the system at all. And up until the Wii, graphics were always the main focus of every new system. But for the first time, Nintendo boldly declared, in a way, that visuals are nice, but gameplay, gameplay, the way that we interact with our software, should be the most compelling part of a gaming experience. And that brings me to virtual reality, which is delivering another gaming revolution, albeit a bit slowly, even today as the technology advances. It's interesting because we all know it's happening. We've always known it. Even our parents knew that uh, virtual reality was going to be the future, but it's still not here. Many of us don't have a VR device, we're not particularly dying to get one, and yet we know it'll be the future in some way, and I just think that's really interesting. Finally, I'd argue that the Wii U was meant to usher in another gameplay revolution, similar in scale to VR, or even like motion controls, except in kind of a different form, or maybe even several different forms. The most important one being what I would consider to be kind of like a subcategory of augmented reality. I don't really have a name for it yet, it's something that is kind of something that I made up, but I kind of call it like assisted reality. So you might be wondering what I'm talking about when I'm talking about like augmented reality in relation to the Wii U gamepad. So for virtual reality devices, you need to have a device on your head that obscures your view on purpose and your entire world becomes this digital world that a game projects at you. While your real physical world, the one that's actually all around you, just kind of fades away. But with augmented reality, at least within the context of the Wii U, it enhances your gameplay experience by delivering the gaming world into your own physical world. The game doesn't want you to forget about your environment, it wants to use your environment. 
It wants to play within your world as you play in the game's world. And in a way, it kind of combines these two realities. Now, some of you might be thinking, Chris, you sound insane. <laughs> you are thinking way too hard about the Wii U, of all things, <laughs> and the gamepad. And you know what? Uh, you might be right. <laughs> but also, I will say, it is very odd to hear myself talk about the Wii U uh, in the way that I have been. But there's just something that bothers me in that... When we transitioned from the Wii U to the Switch, as much as I love the Switch, we seem to have lost this type of concept or medium that the gamepad was able to fulfill. You know, it was this versatile tool that allowed us to interact with our software in completely new and different ways that were just not possible before. You know, the gamepad could be whatever you wanted it to be. Something I love about being a video game fan is witnessing these types of eras or moments when someone introduces something that's just completely weird, <laughs> that challenges developers and players to just think a little bit differently from what we're so used to thinking about, you know, video games in general. And I know, you know, Video games are like a leisure activity, you just chill out with, whatever. But there's just something so beautiful about that, about it kind of being an art form where, you know, everyone is challenged to think differently. And the gamepad was interesting because you could either create a completely brand new experience for that type of controller, or you could add something new to a genre that we're already familiar with. Uh, you know, what it could do for a first-person shooter is very different from what it could do for a puzzle game or a platformer. So I, I just really enjoyed this tool that was kind of like a mediator in between your games and yourself and the world around you. And uh, yeah, it's just so fascinating to me. But I think I'm going to end here. Uh, I want to thank everyone for listening. Um, I hope that you've been enjoying what I've had to share with you today. Uh, I do plan on following up this episode with another one, probably about the same length, and uh, I just want to give some examples of how the gamepad was used effectively and what I think the future of this type of concept uh, could be. So thank you all again for listening, and I look forward to speaking with you all again soon. Bye now. Excuse me, might need to edit that out. <laughs>